So I, I was having a conversation with uh, my children a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about, I was telling them that it's not cool when, when friends tell these uh, mean jokes to each other and, and they uh, laugh at the expense of others uh, crushing each other with, with their words. And um, I was telling them that, that that's not good. And, and apparently, um, this is very common in, in the school. They, they just say, we are friends. It's normal to do this. And we know that we are just giving a hard time to each other. Now, uh, laughing about each other, it, it's OK if you do it occasionally. But, but if the conversations with your friends, with the people around you, are, are actually characterized um, by this harsh talking, this uh, joking one another, this putting down to one another, then that's really not true friendship, don't you think? Um, Christ-like friendship is actually different. It's the opposite. It seeks to, to build up, to, to encourage others, to express humble care and compassion. It bears the burdens of others. It does good to others. Now, this discussion with my kids may sound like a minor detail of daily life, just mundane, silly behavior with little implications. It is not. It is not. The way you live, the way you treat the people around you, the way you treat what you call your friends matters. It matters today, it matters tomorrow, and it matters to infinity and beyond. <laughs> so it, it is strange, but it seems to be that it's our tendency to, to criticize others. To, to, we are very good at identifying their defects and weaknesses. While the view of ourselves is often inflated and, and inaccurate, is distorted. Now, this behavior, unfortunately, is not confined to the halls of a school. It actually affects our marriages, our families, our churches, our friendships. And sometimes the consequences are sad and tragic, like divorce, Divisions, church splits. We are painfully aware of those, aren't we? We're not alone. We will learn today that the Galatians were experiencing some of those challenges. And Paul teaches us, teaches them, and asks through his letter to the Galatians that the way we live, the way we treat each other, the way we have community with one another, it's important, it matters. It matters for today, it matters for tomorrow, it has implications now and it has implications in eternity. And therefore, we will do good in paying attention to what Paul has to say in this letter. So we will uh, start reading in chapter five, verse 25, so please open your Bibles, we are in the one before last sermon before we end our series on Galatians. And today, we're going to uh, study Galatians 6, 1 through 10, but for context, we will start in chapter 5, verse 25. So would you please open your Bibles and read with me Galatians 5, verse 25. This is what Paul says. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. 
Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us briefly ask the Lord that he will illuminate our hearts and spirits. Lord, we come before you again dependent on you. We, we don't get tired of praying because that expresses our need of you. So I pray that you would illuminate our hearts. I need to hear this message as much as my brothers and sisters. So may your spirit open our ears and our eyes, our spiritual ears, our spiritual eyes, so we may hear wondrous things out of your word. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, so um, last week, as Kevin preached the message, we were called to walk by the Spirit while saying no to the desires of our sinful flesh, what Paul calls the flesh. Our sinful nature is what I mean. Um, Paul calls that the flesh. Uh, we also learn that both the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit are actually manifested. They are expressed as we interact with one another. As we live in community, uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit manifests as we serve each other, and it also, unfortunately, manifests when, when we're walking in the flesh, we treat others in, in, a, in a wrong way. Now, Paul tells in 525, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in a step with the Spirit. In other words, it was the Spirit, Galatians, that gave you life. It is the power of the Spirit that, that produced new life in your heart. So if that's the case, if the Spirit gave you life, now walk in a step with the Spirit and do not pursue the works of the flesh. Now, in this particular section of Scripture, in this particular passage, passage of the Scripture, Paul is, is calling the Galatians and is calling us to, to two things, two exhortations. Number one, to bear one another's burdens. This is covered in, in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 6. And then number two, he calls us to persevere in doing good to others. That's covered in verses 6 through 10. And those will be the two main points or sections of the sermon today. Number one, let us bear one another's burdens. And number two, let us not grow weary of doing good to others. So let's start with section number one. Let us bear one another's burdens. From what we're reading, it looks like the Galatians were showing signs of living with the works, by the, by the works of the flesh rather than by the works of the spirit. There was self-centered arrogance and pride as they interact with each other. They were provoking one another. They were envying one another. And those things were bubbling up in their relationships. That's what Paul tells them in verse 26 of chapter 5. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. He's warning them that they should not be conceited. They should not be proud. They should not be irritating one another. They should not be envying one another. That's not the only thing that was happening among the Galatians. It seems to be from what he says in the next verse that they were some of them were thinking that they were highly spiritual. And as they saw themselves as superior to the rest, they were kind of criticizing the ones who were struggling with their sin. And he tells them in, in chapter 6, verse 1, brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. 
Instead of pointing out fingers and correcting with an air of superiority the ones who are truly spiritual, the ones who are really walking by the Spirit, come with a humble, compassionate, gentle attitude, seeking to, to, to help, to restore, not to crush and destroy. The last sentence of verse 1 says, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. If we are spiritually mature, first of all, we are grateful that the power of the Spirit is helping us to grow. But at the same time, we are aware that the presence of sin, like Kevin said last week, is still around us, and we are still vulnerable to it. So Paul calls us here to, to, to be watchful of ourselves, to, to be like sentinels, to be like watchmen, 24-7, 365, looking around, being alert. The enemy can come when we don't think he will come. So he calls us to be alert. Verse 3, for if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. That's the tendency that we have to deceive ourselves, to, to have a high view of ourselves. Now, I'm sure that most of us don't walk in the streets proudly saying, I'm better than you, I'm better than you, I'm better than you. We don't do that. But many times, that's the way we think. And that shows up. Whether you want it or not, that shows up in the way you talk to others, in the way you tell them things, in the way you treat them. How, how are you doing? How are you doing in this department? How are you treating your friends? How are you treating the people around you? How are you treating your children, those who are parents? What is your attitude when you're correcting them for the thousandth time? At least that's the way it feels, right? Like, I told you a thousand times. Are you patient and gentle? Are you kind? What about your spouse? What about people around you? When you bring an observation, when, when you bring a comment, when, when, when you try to correct something, how is your tone? Is it harsh, sarcastic, unkind? Ask them. Ask them. Tell them to be honest with you. Tell them, when I bring an observation, when I bring a correction, how do you feel? And see what they say. It seems so easy. It comes so natural to see the faults of others and to believe we're immune to the same flaws that we criticize. Sometimes we even boast because of other weaknesses, thinking, I thank God that I'm not like him. I thank God that I'm not like her. Unfortunately, uh, that happens and it's very prevalent also in the world of social media. We kind of feel entitled with the right to freely express ourselves, to speak out our minds. Without careful consideration of tone, of motivation, of end goal, we, we quickly point out the weaknesses and mistakes of others. Since we're hiding behind the keyboard and the screen, we, we, we feel that we have the freedom to be bold and blunt and direct when we really should be much more careful in that environment. Why? Because the blast radius, the, the scope of damage that we can create is larger, right? So think twice before you, you make a comment in social media. How we live, how we write those comments, how we treat others, how we even bring observations and criticism 
matters. It matters to God, and it should matter to us. Now see what Paul says instead in verse 2. Instead of that, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Rather than devouring and biting and crushing each other, we are called to bear the burdens of others, to walk alongside them, to carry their baggage, to lighten their heavy weights. We all we all, in one way or another, bring or carry our own baggage. We all need help with our burdens. One day, I may help you with your burdens, and maybe tomorrow, you're the one that will be helping me to carry mine. Note that the solution here is not to just ignore the sin of others. It's not just like forget about them. We still have to be faithful friends faithful spouses, faithful parents, and correct them and instruct them and making the observations. But when we do that, we do it with a spirit of gentleness, of kindness, of love. We come with the desire of seeing them striving and, and growing and so fulfilling the law of Christ, says Paul, Christ who told us to love one another. Christ who showed us how, how to sacrifice for one another, to, to even give our lives for the others, just as he did. You see, Paul doesn't make this request to the Galatians in, in a vacuum. We look to Christ when we think about how to live and how to treat others, we look to Christ. We remember the gospel. We meditate on how patient, how kind, how loving, how merciful, how gracious Christ has been with me. And as I see Christ in that cross, bearing my burdens, carrying my sin. I find strength and desire and motivation to be like him, to treat others kindly, to, to bear their burdens, to walk alongside them, to love them. And so I fulfill the law of my Savior, the one who gave his life for me. As Paul finishes this section in verse 5, he reminds them, for each will have to bear his own load. What he reminds them, what, what he's telling them is that each one of us will have to give an account to God before his throne at the end of time. Okay, so, so not... It's important that we don't confuse this judgment. This is not the judgment that decides whether I'm going to heaven or hell. That has been settled and sealed by the work of Jesus Christ alone. Because of his righteousness, I'm able to be acceptable before God, and I will go to heaven if I have believed fully in Jesus Christ. So I don't have to do anything. But as a Christian, as a son of God, as being saved by the grace and the death of Jesus Christ, I will have to give an account of how I lived my life before the Lord, how I treated others, how I spoke to them. How I sought to walk by the Spirit, and I will be rewarded accordingly. So how I live, how I treat others around me matters. It matters now, and it matters for the last day. So let us seek to bear the burdens of others, to love them, and to care for them. That's the end of section number one. Now let's go to section number two. Let us not grow weary of doing good. 
Now, we will skip for now verse 6 of chapter 6. We'll come back to it in a minute, but we'll start this section in verse 7. So read with me verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Okay. This section starts with a very loud and sobering warning. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Now, sometimes we want to be perceived as good people, as good Christians. And that motivation is not always wrong, but, but the problem is we tend to pretend sometimes that we're doing okay and we're hiding things. You can come to Sunday service every week. You can superficially do the check marks and read your Bible and pray every day. But the people around you don't, cannot see what's going on there inside in your heart. And sometimes we pretend, we want to, to portray an a image that is not real in relation to what's going on inside. But you can deceive other people. You can even deceive yourself and, and pretend that you're doing fine. You cannot deceive God. He cannot be mocked. He can see through. He can see through your heart. He cannot be deceived. And however you decide to live your life, if you sow day by day to the Spirit, you will reap life. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap to the flesh. Verse 8 for the one who sows to the, his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. If you spend all the time you have working, watching news and sports, playing video games, listening to secular music, vacationing, and you're not going to produce much spiritual fruit, if any. Now, I'm not saying that any of those activities are inherently wrong or sinful. They are not. However, although our spiritual lives are invisible, they are actually real. We live in a spiritual world. We are spiritual soils. And this soil needs to be cultivated. It needs to be watered. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be cared for. Or it will not grow fruit and produce it. Whatever you sow in the soil, that is what you're going to get. If you sow grapes, you will get grapes. If you sow apples, you will get apples. If you sow oranges, you will get oranges. If you sow nothing or you sow bad seed, you're going to get nothing, or you're going to get even worse, weeds. Now, last year, I had the chance to uh, be in Napa Valley, California. This is a valley well known uh, to have beautiful uh, vineyards and nice wineries. So I had the chance to have a private tour of, with a person that uh, was in charge of the whole process of producing wine for a particular winery. Uh, me and my family were, were with them, with this person, and, and she gave us a tour of the place, and she was just educating us about the production of wine. And oh my goodness, I didn't know anything about wine, and it's so amazing and so intricate and complex, the process of producing wine. It all really starts when, when they are preparing the seeds for the grapes and the soil that is going to receive those seeds. When they do that, how they do it will have an impact on the production of the wine that is going to come in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. 
from the time they are putting the seeds. So can you imagine if they would have thought, oh, it's far away? No, whatever they do today is going to have a profound impact on how that wine is going to come. The texture, the color, the, the, the way it will come out, the quality of the wine is going to be influenced by how 5, 10, 20 years before those people were working and, and putting the seeds on the soil. That's how our spiritual lives are. What we saw today is going to have an effect in the near term, in the medium term, and in the long haul. The little decisions that you make today will have repercussions, reverberations in the future. If you invest some daily time in praying, if you have fellowship with, with your brothers and sisters, if you seek to grow and to give an account to others, if, if you spend time and energy memorizing, reading, uh, meditating in the scripture, if you spend time in your commute listening to sermons, listening to teachings, if you do that, those little things that you did day by day are going to start accumulating. The more you invest, the more return you are going to get, the more you're going to reap. If you sow to the Spirit, you will reap abundant, rich, fully joyful life. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption, death, and decay, and people around you are going to know and experience that. So my purpose here, to be clear, is not to make you feel guilty. All the opposite. Just like you, I'm more used to the world that my eyes can see and what this world can offer to me. I'm not naturally aware of the spiritual world. And that's why I need the Word of God to awaken my spiritual senses. And just as much as you do, our spiritual lives need to be nurtured. Let us sow day by day to the Spirit and say no to the desires of your sinful nature, of your flesh. Verse 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Just like in the agricultural world, results just do not pop up instantaneously. It takes time and effort before we can see results. You don't sow a seed and the next day it just comes out. Oranges, apples, grapes, they all take time to grow, to bloom, to produce. <laughs> in, in reality, nothing that is worth it, nothing that is worth it actually comes easy. You don't become a great baseball player by doing nothing. You have to sweat, you have to practice, you have to go for hours and do your work several days a week. You don't become a great gymnast just by watching the Olympics. You don't become a student with good grades unless you diligently work in your assignments week in and week out. You have to work. You have to put the effort. But as human beings, when we do that, we get tired. Sometimes we get exhausted. And sometimes we want to quit. We want to give up. Perhaps some of you are in that state. You're tired of fighting. You're tired of walking this life. You're tired of trying to live by the Spirit. Wait a minute. I will ask you to, for a moment, do not focus on how 
hard you've been working and how tired you feel. For a moment, imagine and look beyond today, beyond tomorrow, look far. If you persevere, if you don't give up, if you do not quit, one day at the right time, in the due reason, you will reap. If you are discouraged and you see little progress and the effort seems to be disproportionate compared to the benefits, oh, may God open your spiritual eyes right now May he provide to you spiritual binoculars, spiritual telescopes. Then your spiritual eyes may be able to see far, far, far into eternity and know that one day your efforts will pay back. One day you will reap. Perhaps you are a weary parent. Perhaps you are a weary spouse, a weary disciple of Christ. You have invested time and energy and sweat and tears and effort, and you don't see progress. You don't see the return. Listen. Listen what God is telling you. Do not give up. Do not quit. Because at the due time, in the due season, you will rip. That's what's walking by faith and not by sight, to, to be doing the things that our eyes, physical eyes cannot see, but with faith of what is coming. We need this encouragement. We need these reminders from the Word of God to persevere, to not give up, to go on, to stay still, to, to wait, because you will reap. Verse 10. So then... As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. In your journey, in your spiritual walk, seek for opportunities to do good to everyone, says Paul. Co-workers, cashiers, flight attendants, janitors, they all should be recipients of the goodness that comes from a fruitful life, from a life that is empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit. But in all of that, your brothers and sisters in Christ, your family in the faith has a special place, should have a special place in your hearts. They should be the ones who receive more love and more care and more compassion and grace and gentleness and kindness from you. They are part of your family. They were bought with the blood of Christ. They were born of the same seed as you. They are your brothers and sisters. They are your family. So they should have a prominent place in your list of priorities. They should be recipients of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. They should be aware of your love and your care and the grace that comes from the Spirit of God. But among them, there is one group that has a, an even more special place. Do you know who they are? You actually may be surprised to find out this. Read with me, verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Now, I'm not a pastor right now. I'm taking time off. So I feel full freedom to say what I'm going to say. <laughs> Why? Why do you need to share all good with the ones who teach you the word, who your pastors, to your pastors? Why? Why is that important? You see, if you are a financial investor, you want to maximize profit, and you are going to want to hire the best. You want somebody that really knows what they are doing, that who will take very good care of your riches. You don't want somebody that 
just does that in his free time. No. No, no, no. This is important. You want him to be skillful and prepared. You want him to spend time learning and knowing his field. You want somebody that is skilled and that is passionate for what he does. Now, most of us are not financial investors, but all of us in some way or another care about money and financial or material resources in one way or another. But this is the thing. Money and possessions, they are going to burn. They are going to be good for nothing in eternity. They will not matter in the future. But the spiritual riches, oh yes, they will matter. They matter for today, and they matter for eternity. If you invest rightly in this life, you can be a spiritual billionaire in the next life. So you do want a worker that is skilled. You want the best worker you can. You want him to be dedicated in his task. You want him to become an expert in spiritual crops, spiritual seed, spiritual soils, and spiritual riches, and that is your pastor. When you lose sight, he helps you to get back on track. When you go straight, he runs after you. When you forget the truth, he reminds you of that truth. He cares for you. He cares for your spiritual life. And he does that primarily by teaching you the word of God. His task is important. His task is critical. It's a matter of life or death. So, not because I tell you, but because of the word of God tells you, value your pastor. Share all good things with him. Pray for him. Encourage him. Bless him. Help him. Serve him. Provide for him and his material needs. You don't want him to be distracted by that. The stakes are too high. Share all good things, all good things with him. God has given you amazing skills and in some cases material riches and resources. Use them for the glory of God and share them all with the one who teaches you the word of God. You will not regret it because you and I need somebody to show us the way, to teach us how to walk, to teach us how to live, to teach us how to treat others, to teach us that the way we live today, the way we treat others now matters. It matters now, and it matters for eternity. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you and, and we pray that, that your word will do its work in the hearts and the spirits of my brothers and sisters. I pray that we all feel convicted where we need to feel convicted, that we all will meditate and think on how we're doing in our spiritual lives, that we will all be convicted if we're not paying attention to the word of your spirit and that we will find times to stop what we're doing and to, and to listen to your spirit. We, we ask you that all of these things will be manifested richly in the way we live and interact with each other, that we will bear the burdens of others and that we will not get weary of doing good to one another. We pray all these things. In your name, amen.